for joining me tonight. My name is Ian Bushfield. I'm the executive director of the BC Humanist Association. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the next of our From the Research Desk talks, uh, Public Funds for Public Education, our work on private schools and the funding that the British Columbia government gives to them. I acknowledge that I am working and living on the unceded and traditional territories of the Honkamenem and Skohomish speaking peoples here in what's now known as Burnaby, British Columbia. So I wanna start by talking a bit about some of the previous work we've done quite a while ago actually on religion in public schools in what was then largely our secular schools campaign. Uh, I'll move then into what the independent school system is in British Columbia, some of the polling that we and others have done on it, uh, and then get into some of the past work we've done on investigating this system, uh, who benefits, who's getting the most money, uh, what some of the exclusions are. And then I'm going to talk about some of the new work we've done, which is in this report that will be going out next week once it's finalized and finished editing, which looks specifically at how well do students from private and public schools fare in the University of British Columbia. And we got our hands on some data from a Freedom of Information request that will be quite interesting. I'm going to try to keep this to an hour. If you have questions either on Facebook or here in the chat on Zoom, please just ask away as we go and I'll keep an eye on them. Uh, so let's start it, get started. Our secular schools issue has been going for quite a while. Um, and then I forgot to switch the video back to myself. Back in, even before I was well involved in the association in 2009, back in the 90s, there was actually a lot of issues in BC where uh, our public schools had the same kind of religious influence you hear about across the continent. So there were Bible distributions in grade five classes by the Gideons. Uh, there was legislated a requirement that there be prayer that start every day uh, and creationism was coming up in Abbotsford. Uh, our association worked together with the BC Civil Liberties Association at different times to end the uh, prayers in BC public schools and that happened in the late 80s and early 90s. Pretty much I believe when the Harcourt government first got elected prior to that, our school act is actually pretty unique in Canada as it says that and has said since the beginning that our schools are to be strictly secular and non-sectarian. Uh, the one issue there is that for quite a while they had put in a caveat that you should also start with a Bible reading every day. So mostly secular and very sectarian. Uh, once the Bible readings were removed, our schools are uh, legally and constitutionally required to be secular. Nevertheless, Gideon Bibles were still being distributed and into the actually 2010s, a few districts or were doing Gideon Bibles and into the 90s, Abbotsford most notably was doing creationism. Our association and the BC Civil Liberties Association challenged the Abbotsford School District at the time saying, you know, we don't think you can teach creationism in a public school setting. That is a religious practice. That's, you know, indoctrinating kids in religion and a violation of this requirement that schools be secular. The school district at the time disagreed and was eventually overruled by the education minister at the time. And they were forced to write a policy, which they, I believe, named their origins of life policy, which says something very meaningless like, teachers can believe what they want and students can believe what they want, but there is a curriculum that they have to follow, but no one should be punished for not believing the curriculum, but it has to be taught, which I guess is fine if that's what they want to settle because it's correct, but it shouldn't really need to be said like that. And it's weird that it is, but it's Abbotsford. And so there was a strong religious element on the school board there. Uh, when I started getting involved in the association in 2009 to 2012, there was a lot of notes coming from Chilliwack and Abbotsford that the Gideons in the area were still doing Bible distribution in grade five classrooms. And so we raised some complaints with those school districts. I went and drove out to a Chilliwack school board meeting at one point and actually spoke about how this is an inappropriate use of public school uh, resources 
to promote the indoctrination of one religious viewpoint. Uh, the school districts both moved their policies to what they called distribution of materials policies, where in theory, any religious organization could ask and have their materials distributed. Now, it just turns out that the Gideons were the only people who do that because most other religions are fairly respectful of the uh, separation of church and state in Canada. And because Chilliwack uh, was continuing to do this, we eventually approached both Chilliwack and Abbotsford and asked if we could submit uh, atheist materials. We got a permission to publish a or reprint a published atheist comic book that we figured if we had to, we could print enough of them for all grade fives in a district for about a thousand dollars, maybe even less, in which case it was doable. It was something we could fundraise for and do if we needed to. But the main point there was a legal threat to say, you know, we're going to call your bluff. If you say all religious and non-religious viewpoints will be shared through this program, then include our atheist book beside the Gideon Bibles to all grade fives. And very quickly, the superintendents seemed to close the distribution programs in both districts. I think Center for Inquiry Canada also did some work in Chilliwack using a similar attempt to put a Richard Dawkins book in the classrooms. And following that, there hasn't been, as far as we can tell, any major systemic issues with religion in BC public schools. There were a couple other districts that had policies on the books about Gideon Bibles, but as far as we could tell, they hadn't been used in a while. And after, after we wrote to them, they changed their policies. I think my favorite was one South Interior district where their policy was to only distribute books that were not secular, which if you think about it means religious, but I think that was mostly just a typo on their part. They meant not religious or secular, and that was quietly changed after our lobbying of an email. We still get the occasional letter from a parent or a student in a high school around BC noting that their high school graduation might be taking, well not this year, but in some other years takes place in a church, or they're concerned about the predominance of Christian, very, you know, overtly Christian songs at uh, Christmas ceremony or winter ceremonies. Um, there's occasionally teachers in some bio classes are reportedly bringing up questions about intelligent design or creationism or presenting those kind of materials. And in those cases, we try to empower the person who's written to us to go through the channels to raise the complaint, you know, first have a conversation with the teacher, have a conversation with the uh, principal. If that doesn't work, keep working your way up the chain. And we haven't had to go so far yet. And to, for example, you know, write letters or um, launch a human rights complaint. But that's one of those places where we're always keeping an eye out. And so the other thing that comes up, though, when you start looking at education in British Columbia is our province does something unique in funding independent schools. So these are private schools that, you know, aren't the public system. There are a couple other provinces, provinces that do fund private schools. I don't have the memory and uh, the data in front of me. I know Alberta does, but not too many others. Ontario doesn't, for example. Uh, BC has had private schools since 1858, and they started getting funding in 1977 following aggressive lobbying. I believe it was the Bill Bennett government in that era. Um, the Independent Schools Act was brought in in 1989, and that actually brought all private schools under provincial regulation, which is, I think, somewhat unique in Canada. So you can't just have John Doe's Bible College out in the interior, not accepting any government money and just doing whatever you want. You still have some inspections coming from the government, which makes sense because if you're you know, taking care of children for large periods of time, I think most of us can agree there's some value in having some oversight to that. Now, BC private schools are largely grouped, are grouped into four separate categories. And two of the categories are pretty meaningless for our purposes. Those are groups three and four. Uh, group four, I believe, is mostly international and overseas schools. Group three are those schools who don't want to accept the regulations that come with getting the funding, thus the more strict re regulations. 
So group one and two schools all employ BC certified teachers. They have to meet the BC curriculum and they can't, and then how much money they get is what divides them. So group one schools are your religious schools and any school, private school that operates at or below the cost of a neighboring public school. So if it costs $5,000 per student to run a Vancouver school board school, then to classify as a group one private school, your school must run at $5,000 per students or less. And if you meet those qualifications, the government will pay you half of what it pays to the public school. So $5,000 to uh, the public school in Vancouver would be $2,500 per student in a private school in there. And this varies uh, by around the province. So we can't just say private schools get exactly this. And I made those numbers up except for the 50%. Group two schools cost more to run. So those are generally your elite um, preparatory schools. They still, and they can charge significantly higher tuition and operate it as expensively as they want they get 35% of their funding that a public school would get. So West Point Gregg Academy is probably the most prominent example in many Vancouverites mind. That school gets public money in the tune of millions of dollars, which I think shocks a lot of people. Uh, there's also a few other caveats that all independent schools must not have programs that quote, would in theory or in practice promote or foster doctrines of racial or ethnic superiority or persecution, religious intolerance or persecution, social change through violent action or sedition. Uh, so you can't start your anarchist uprising school, but I think some of the non-religious and some of the humanists among us would uh, wonder about whether some of these uh, fundamentalist schools that receive public funding are promoting religious superiority. Uh, there's a question on Facebook about special needs schools. Those I believe are generally uh, group one that receive 50% of the funding. There are a couple probably exceptions. I haven't looked at them all. One I know of is the Fraser Academy that's in Kitsilano. They treat, I believe it's uh, students with learning disabilities. I believe they're a group one school. Uh, there are a number of indigenous private or independent schools that have been set up. Uh, those are largely group two schools, as far as I understand it. Uh, and the other thing to note with all of these is, in particular, the faith-based schools, the religious schools, which are almost all group one funded at 50%, they have the power to preferentially hire teachers and select students based on their religious beliefs. Uh, and this extends, and as I'll get to later, to all staff in the schools. So the janitor can be required to sign a statement of faith and students can be expelled if they don't agree to that or are seen to not be following that. And that's one thing that comes up quite a bit. Uh, polling, we've done, we did a poll in 2016 that asked about funding of private schools uh, and a few other groups have done it and they all have been fairly consistent. Uh, our poll found that 63% of British Columbians oppose funding going to private secular schools and 70% oppose it going to religious schools. A group called Public Education BC did a similar poll, I believe it was last year, that found 69% opposed it going to faith-based schools and 66% opposed it going to private secular schools and 78% opposed those group two elite schools getting uh, funding. It's pretty consistent. I think QP also did a poll right around the time we released ours in 2016 and also found very similar numbers. About two thirds of British Columbians generally don't like the idea of public money going to private schools. Um, just quickly, the argument in favor of it is generally that um, private schools, by funding them, take some of the burden off the public system. There's this argument that if a student goes to a private school instead of a public school, we're actually saving money because instead of spending, say, $1,000 for that student to go to school, we're only spending 500 and their parents are covering the other half. Um, the BC Humanist Association ultimately took a position that we don't agree with this system for the basic equity-ish argument around it, which is that you know to get into these private schools, you generally need tuition or means, and it segregates us on religious grounds, but also on uh, socioeconomic grounds. Um, yeah, and as you're asking in the chat, uh, 
the group one schools includes both religious and secular schools. And I'll talk a bit about in some of the data we look at later about how that breakdown is. Um, but the group is mainly focused on the fact that they meet the curriculum, that they employ certified teachers, and how much it costs to run the school. It's not so much about um, the character of the school. But one thing that I think will concern most viewers and most supporters of this organization is the oversight. So one of the first things we did is we started to dig into independent schools and we said, all right, there is an office of independent schools within the Ministry of Education that's responsible for doing these inspections. All of these schools need to be inspected. So who is who are the inspectors? You know, who is actually going in, making sure they're following the rules? Uh, it turns out since 1985, when this office was established, there have been five different inspectors. Um, the Vancouver Sun has done a lot of good reporting on this, uh, previous education reporters. And the first inspector was Gary Ensing, who came from the Society of Christian Schools of BC and the Federation of Independent Schools Association. That latter group, FISA, is the main lobby group for independent schools. Uh, he was involved in those uh, in the early 80s or in the 70s and 80s and was one of the voices that really helped actually establish funding for independent schools. And he was appointed as the first inspector of independent schools and until 1998. That's when Jim Beek, who was the former principal of Timothy Christian School, uh, he is also notable for having written a number of Bible books for kids, youth, and adults. And he was the inspector until 2005. Following him, Susan Penner, who was a former principal of White Rock Christian Academy and Credo Christian School, became the inspector. Uh, she was followed by Ed Vanderboom from 2009 to 2011. He was a VP at White Chris Rock uh, Christian Academy, I believe at the same time as Susan Penner, and then also followed her as principal of Credo Christian High School. Uh, and then finally, the current inspector since 2011 is Theo Vandeved, Vandeved, and he was a former principal at Timothy Christian School. So I think you'll have detected the trend, which is that all of these inspect chief inspectors have come from uh, Christian schools within British Columbia and generally evangelical ones and surprisingly even the same two Timothy Christian School and White Rock Christian Academy come up again and again uh, on the one hand this can be kind of understandable as you want someone who comes from a private school possibly would go the argument to be the person in charge of them and inspecting them on the other hand it's a kind of fox in the hen house situation where if we want to ensure that uh, respect for diversity and pluralism are being protected in these schools and some of the newer moves to also protect LGBTQ students within these schools, then perhaps having someone from outside the Christian system. For example, a large number of BC's private schools are actually Catholic and none of them have even been represented, let alone any of the other religions or any of the secular uh, private schools or someone from even outside of private schooling. Now this isn't to question the ability or job that any of these inspectors have done, just to note that it's a trend that has gone uninterrupted since the foundation of the schools. So following that inspection, our big look into schools was our report that came out a couple of years ago now called Who Reaps the Most Rewards? And what we wanted to do there was figure out where the public school, where this funding for private schools is actually going. Uh, for some reason, I didn't write the number in my notes. Uh, oh no, here it is. There's, in 2018, the funding for private schools in BC was th worth $358 million, and I believe it's exceeded $400 million in the current budget. It goes up as public private school enrollment goes up and as inflation goes up. Um, it's, so we're spending $400 million on schools where many would argue that parents would send their kids otherwise. The special needs schools being an exception, but parents would definitely send their kids to an elite preparatory school without a government subsidy. In many cases, they have the capacity. Uh, and in many cases, parents would send their kids to faith-based schools if that was the priority for them without having the federal, the provincial subsidy. 
But in this Who Reaps the Most Rewards report, what we did was we downloaded the list of all schools from the British Columbia Ministry of Education's website, and we went through every one of their websites. I actually did this over a few days and tried to identify what religion they were. Some were quite obvious, the Catholic ones were quite clear, uh, many of the Christian ones. And when I say Christian, most of the time this is just generic. They don't identify as Anglican or um, another specific denomination. They are just generically followers of Jesus Christ, they might say. Uh, and then there were a small number of Sikh, uh, Jewish, and a few others. Mennonites came up, for example. But the overwhelming majority of religious schools were either Christian or Catholic. Uh, we found that of the 365 independent schools in BC, 55% of them were religious, 8% uh, we classified as indigenous. They, I am not clear on exactly how much spirituality is worked into their programs, but it's kind of a separate issue. And then 37% were, as far as we could tell, secular. Uh, one or two of those may have had a slight religious character in its history, but I couldn't find evidence that they were a currently uh, religious school in the same way that, you know, Little Flower Academy, the Catholic high school in Vancouver is. However, even though only 55% of BC private schools were religious, 74% of all funding that the provincial government gave to private schools went to these religious schools. So despite the fact they only make up a slight majority, they are getting quite a strong majority of the funding. They're quite getting three quarters of it. And not only that, but 62% of the funding went to either Christian or Catholic schools. So those two categories are taking up the lion's share of the funding. Uh, our report, which is on our website, and I'll link to it after the show, uh, also breaks down uh, funding by number of schools or number of students and so forth. Uh, and so that was quite an interesting one to look at. Uh, following that, we decided because we'd gone through, I'd gone through all these school websites to pull out some examples of schools that I think, even if you can justify having faith-based schools within British Columbia and funding them, might push the line too far. For example, schools that are very explicit about teaching creationism in science class, which I think we would argue and many would argue undermines the British Columbia curriculum and therefore should put into question whether they are actually following the curriculum. And some schools were surprisingly blatant about it. Uh, I, think, I think I went into this search looking, assuming that it would be somewhat subtle but for example, Valley Christian School that's based in Mission said rate on its website that creation is taught in science class in full quotes. Uh, Carver Christian School in Vancouver said, yes, we teach creation on their FAQ page, including young earth creationism. And one of the most notable examples is Heritage Christian Online School, which is also owns BC Online School as a subsidiary and owns I believe it's bconlineschool.ca and onlineschool.ca and is the largest homeschooling site or resource in the province. It said on its bio 11 curriculum at the time that it will compare ideas about creation and evolution as though they are equal scientific theory and approaches, which most secularists will agree is not true. And we had several other examples that we posted on our website of places where they would either suggest teaching the controversy or otherwise presenting biblical creationism ideas within the science class. The other big thing to, that we wanted to look for when going through all these websites was how do they treat uh, queer, LGBTQ plus students, staff, etc. This was a little bit harder to find because it varied depending on what their community standards were. Many schools did have codes of conduct. One of the clear ones was Abbotsford's Christian School, whose community standards ended up excluding uh, members, students, teachers, support staff, and others who don't, quote, understand marriage to be a covenant between a man and a woman. Uh, they also ban uh, any promiscuity outside of marriage and anyone who doesn't respect the sanctity of life from the moment of conception. So if you have a 16-year-old 
student get pregnant, they expect that girl to carry that child to term or they will expel her as far as I read that policy, which seems pretty horrendous. Uh, similar policies exist at King's Christian School and the Nanaimo Christian School, uh, Surrey's Pacific Academy. And I wanna stop on Surrey's Pacific Academy uh, for a second, because this school made the news a number of years ago when it turned out that their admission policy also favored students who could demonstrate that they spoke in tongues. Uh, and I believe that's still on their website today. Uh, so if you are the type of evangelical Christian who has the spirit take you and speak through you, then you get a preferential spot at Pacific Academy. So now I want to turn gears and talk about this new report that we are going to be releasing next week. Uh, one of the questions that comes up with private schools and one of the claims that comes up a lot is the value there is that you go to this school, you will get a better education and therefore you will do better in life or at least in university. And that's a difficult test to claim. That's a difficult claim to test. Uh, the Fraser Institute releases an annual report card ranking all schools in British Columbia and generally ranks many private schools favorably. It ranks them on a number of criteria, including most notably standardized testing uh, and also graduation rates and performance. Uh, when you have a school where you can select your students and exclude students who don't perform as well. Uh, it can be easy to inflate your graduation rates that way. There were also some reports last year and the year before, I believe in 2018, out of Ontario of private schools where teachers straight up offered to inflate students' grades. And this was most notable because the University of Waterloo released the uh, criteria they use for uh, curving schools. So what they found after a few years in their engineering faculty was students from certain schools tended to do significantly better than they would have expected and others did worse. And that was all based on their high school graduating GPA. So you had a kid come with an 80% from a high school over here and he got 60% in university. And then you had a kid with an 80% at this other high school and he got 85% in university. And this was found consistently enough that the school started applying a handicap to some schools and adjusting their uh, grades to kind of counteract this intentional or not inflation that was seemed to be occurring. Now we can't get, we tried to get a similar list from UBC. It might exist, it probably exists, but uh, UBC has won uh, court cases against FOI requests around its admissions policies. So we can't actually get that without trying to go higher than the BC Court of Appeal, which seems like a fool's errand for the purposes we're trying to get here. That said, UBC was willing to give us data on the performance of students at UBC based on their graduating high school. So I had to go back and forth in front between December and February, I believe, with UBC's uh, FOI department, basically trying to narrow down exactly what data we could get and what would be useful. And we'll probably need to get some more, but with COVID-19 and their offices being closed, it gets a little hard to get the administrative data out that we would have wanted. But what we managed to find was a data set of 3,651 students who were admitted to UBC in winter 2014 to both the Vancouver and Okanagan uh, campuses. Uh, they came from 162 different schools, although 46 of the students were reported as coming from an unknown school, so we simply excluded them. Um, we had to do a bit of mixing around because UBC's list of schools didn't quite match the ministry's miss list, uh, and there was about seven schools we combined together. So in the end, we had a data set of 3,605 students from 156 schools. And when you have a data set like that, you have not the most robust, but you have enough that you can start to compare how do students do depending on where they came from. And we had kind of, we had three 
uh, criteria that we managed to get data for. So we got how many were still at UBC after four years. This is why we got the 2014 class, entering class, or the high school graduation class from 2014, so we could look at their performance in 2018. So how many were retained after four years, how many graduated within four years, and what was their sessional average in their fourth year. Um, in the future, I think we'll also try to get their overall GPA and some additional information to compare that, but we at least know how well are they doing in their fourth year, how many are still there, and how many have graduated. And we chose four years based on my presumption, which is based on the fact every, almost every course at UBC lists itself as a four-year course, that the expectation is students will graduate in four years. But UBC noted with its response that uh, apparently graduating in four years is not that common, and we actually found out less than one in three students at UBC graduate in four years these days. This is due to students taking a year off, going into co-op, extending their term, and so I guess next time we need to use the six-year graduation rate, but it's a minor quibble. I think we can still compare our private and public school apples and oranges. And we also did some statistics on all of these data sets and samples to tell if any of the differences we might see in averages were due to uh, chance or were statistically valid. And so this allows us, because we already had that data set categorizing all the different private schools, to compare public school graduates with private school graduates and to compare secular private school graduates with religious private school graduates and students from group one and group two private schools. Uh, there was only one group four school in, our, in the data set we received and no group three, so there's nothing we can really say about that. Uh, UBC also excluded any school where there were fewer than five students uh, who made it to UBC, who, who made it to four years, which makes sense because they don't want to uh, violate the privacy of any of the four students in that set because you could start to figure out how well people are doing from that. And that's largely okay from our point of view since we have a fairly robust data set otherwise. Uh, I think the first, the most, you know, the headline of this report though is really, you know, what is the grade point average? What is the sessional average of public school and private school students after four years? Uh, public school students, where did I lose my data? Public school students had an average of 72.2%. Private school students had an average of 73.8%. So it's a 1.6% bump that going to private school seems to give. Now, when we did our statistics, this is meaningless. Um, evidence was very weak. We got a P for those scientists or academic types. We had a P.107. Uh, usually 0.05 is what, or smaller is what you're looking for, for statistical significance there. Um, in terms of retention rates, 87 and 88 percent of students were still at UBC after four years. Uh, the biggest difference in this entire report that we did find is that private school graduates were significantly more likely to graduate within four years than students from public schools. 27% uh, of private school grads had finished in four years versus 21% of public school students. And those students who went to those elite group two schools, 31% of them had graduated within four years. And I think that's largely explainable for a few reasons. Um, if you go to private school, you're more likely to have access to IB and AP, you know, international baccalaureate and advanced placement courses, which are university prep courses. These are courses that allow you to take university credits in high school. So when you get into, high, into university, you're starting with less work to do. So finishing within four years doesn't seem that hard. Then there's also very significant socioeconomic dif differences between public and private school students. Uh, we found a Statistics Canada report from a couple years ago that looked in a different way at the performance of public and private school students and found that largely all of the differences could be explained by socioeconomic effects. So 
students don't perform any better if they go to private school after four years. They don't stay at UBC any more likely, but they do graduate more likely if they came from a private school. Uh, when we compared group one and group two private schools, there was not a significant difference across most of the metrics. Um, most of our charts, for anyone who has seen box and whisker plots, these won't work on here, look very much like this. Everything is overlapping, which shows there's a lot of correlation. Um, interestingly, perhaps for some of the more anti-religious listeners out there is uh, graduates of faith-based schools didn't do any worse than graduates of secular schools, as far as we could tell. In fact, the one um, trend we could see at the edge of significance there was that students who went to small secular schools, see, small or secular private schools, or whose graduating class was smaller, um, they tended to do uh, have lower um, graduation rates and lower uh, retention rates, but their GPAs were still very similar. We also managed to look at the largest public school districts and see how their students did at UBC. Uh, Central Okanagan students did the best, probably because they go directly to UBC Okanagan. Their students uh, had a 77% average. Students from North Van had a 75% average. Students from Langley also had a 75% ag average. Uh, students from Burnaby had a 70.8%. Surrey had a was at the bottom at 69%. And Coquitlam is at 71% with the lowest averages of the public school districts or the larger public school districts. We weren't super interested in that, but I think that could also be explained by socioeconomic status largely. Uh, because there are so many schools from Vancouver in our data set, we also have a table breaking down how the largest schools in the city of Vancouver did at UBC. Uh, the most, the smartest kids, I guess, came from Templeton Secondary in East Vancouver in Strathcona with an 80% sessional average uh, versus Killarney Secondary students had a 63% average, and that was based on 57 students. Uh, the best public or the best private school was Crofton House, which was a elite private school. Uh, Vancouver College, which is a secular group one private school, fell right in the middle at about 76%. And Little Flower Academy was slightly behind at 74%. So there's not a huge spread in these numbers either. Um, I think the main thing we try to highlight in here is that there isn't actually that much of a difference between private school and public school graduates other than the graduation rates. I think the rates can largely be explained by socioeconomic and some of the differences within the schools, but the claim that private schooling will give you a better advantage doesn't seem to be refuted or doesn't seem to be supported in the long term here. I think one of the possible reasons for that is maybe once you get to UBC, after four years, you just kind of all become the same and UBC has a leveling effect. Uh, if that's the case, that kind of further devalues the um, purported advantages of your high school. So if you went to a high school that claims it'll give you a really significant advantage and it turns out after four years at UBC, you do just as well as someone who didn't, that's rather interesting. Um, There are a number of limitations to our data set. We are only able to look at students who got into UBC. Uh, we don't have the acceptance rates of different schools. We didn't look at any of that. So there's very much a selection bias in who these students are. Um, there can be factors like private school students might go to different kinds of universities than public school students. I can definitely imagine that students who went to very fundamentalist religious private schools would be more likely to go to Trinity Western University, for example, or a faith-based post-secondary than to UBC, which might be seen as uh, her heretical or <laughs> not ideal for their students. And that would be hard to test the differences in. Um, 
students may just pursue post-secondary education at different rates from these different schools, depending on their socioeconomic status and a number of other things. That said, I do think this does give us some information and does at least, it doesn't add to, it doesn't support the claim that's out there that uh, private schools give you an advantage in any way. Uh, we do hopefully want to follow up with additional um, requests for information from UBC to hopefully get a little bit more information out there and to build upon this data set because we did identify as we got the data that, oh, it would have actually been better to get the six-year graduation rate and some of the other averages we could have gotten would have been useful. And so that's mostly what that report says. Uh, I see a comment in Facebook talking about community being a big factor. Uh, and that's something religious schools are very, and religious societies are very much able to do. So yeah, and that's definitely something that I know private schools often have smaller class sizes and more direct support, both from, you know, directly from the teacher who is often has smaller class sizes and can provide more direct support and from extracurricular um, study groups and things like that that can help students in different ways and can help them perform uh, better. There's a question in the chat on Zoom asking about how the data will come out. We will release the full data set uh, as an Excel sheet or something like that on our website as well. The report contains a number of charts. Um, some of this data is a little bit hard to visualize and so they're mostly in box plots which show you the average and some of the variation so you can kind of compare how these work um, and hopefully that's useful. I'm always open to other ideas about data visualization but I think there aren't too many ways to compare giant lists of percentages. Uh, just an anecdote, when we got the data from UBC, what a lot of institutions do with freedom of information requests is they'll pull the data into a spreadsheet or whatever you need. They'll then print it off and scan it and then lock that PDF. So all you can do is essentially transcribe it line by line into another Excel sheet. You can't copy paste it. Uh, you might be able to print it off, scan it, and then character recognize it, but it gets, they make it really frustrating to deal with their data, probably because they want to discourage a lot of frivolous FOI requests because some of them can take a long time. Uh, so that meant there was a day or two of just copy pasting or copy, copying over numbers from these spreadsheets. And I did have to go over a second time because there was one or two errors that I made the first time. But you know, once those are cleaned up or were cleaned up, I had a pretty good feeling about the sense of this data, uh, how different schools were doing. Uh, I'll open it up to a couple questions. I guess the only next thing to talk about is that you know, there, our call has been for moving much of the funding that goes to these private schools into public systems, particularly the faith-based ones, particularly the elite ones. Uh, there is good value that many people can claim and I think is out there right now for those who aren't served well by the public system in terms of special needs. Uh, finding new ways to make sure that those students are supported in different ways is always important. And I, you know, we're not advocating leaving students with special needs unsupported. Uh, the governments have largely over the years been unwilling to touch this issue. The first thing that changed a little bit was actually just last month, the provincial government announced changes to what's called distributed learning, the online schooling uh, funding. Uh, distributed learning connects uh, homeschooled students with teachers either in the public or private school system and has them work with those teachers directly. Uh, Previous governments had raised the rates for independent school, in online independent schools, essentially. So instead of being 50% or 35%, depending on the classification, they'd gone to, I think it was like 70% and 45% roughly. Uh, and the government just this spring decided they would roll those back. Uh, the argument that private schools made for increasing their funding was that many of the smaller ones or the group one ones no longer needed to charge tuition. So they weren't actually charging tuition. These students were getting 
discounted education essentially because those schools were operating with less funds than the public school system. And now there was a little bit of uproar because these students and these parents will likely have to either pay tuition or their schools will operate on less money. Uh, but it does show that there can be some movement uh, towards reprioritizing that money towards the public school system. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for your kind comment on the Facebook page saying you're glad to have some better evidence to help understand. And yes, we're enjoying this and hopefully can do more work on this and are always interested in other avenues we can uh, explore. Uh, I'll give a couple announcements and then I'll open it up to any other questions. On Monday afternoon, I'll actually be speaking for the association at the Legislature's Finance Committee. That'll be at 4.50 p.m. You can stream the Finance Committee hearings from the Legislature's website, and that link has been shared in our emails, and I'll post it to the Facebook page on Monday afternoon. Uh, we are currently hiring summer students. We, uh, last year, we had three Canada summer jobs. Students work, or interns work with us two on campaigns research, and they really helped do an amazing amount of work on legislative prayers to the point where we managed to get the province and the legislature to change its policy. They changed it from doing prayers to prayers and reflections, but it's a step in the right direction. But they together worked so diligently all summer and uh, analyzed over 870 prayers that had been said in the legislature over 13 years. And I definitely encourage people to read that report and the uh, supplementals that have come off it. We'll potentially do another one of these talks in about two weeks on June 19th. I have to confirm that with Teal, who's not here today, uh, and some of the stuff he's been working on, I think on property taxes he wants to talk about. And that's one of the things I'll be talking to the Finance Committee about, as well as this work that I just talked about. Uh, our annual general meeting for any members who are listening is on June 27th. If you didn't get the email, look for it. Let me know, please RSVP if you're a member. We need at least 10 people. We're gonna do it over Zoom. We're gonna try and get through an online AGM as smoothly as we can. Thank you for your patience on that. And to everyone who's listening, uh, thank you. And look for the report on Monday. I really want it out on Monday. Yeah, thank you for spending some time with us. Um, take care. <laughs>